guys and welcome back to reading club so today i'm going to read you harry potter and the sorcerer's stone chapter 15. chapter 15 the forbidden forest things couldn't have been worse filch took them down to professor McGonagall's study on the first floor where they sat and waited without saying a word to each other hermione was trembling excuses alibis and wild cover-up stories chased each other around harry's brain each more feeble than the last he couldn't see how they were going to get out of trouble this time. They were cornered. How could they have been so stupid as to forget the cloak? There was no reason on earth that Professor McGonagall would accept for their being out of bed and creeping around the school in the dead of night, let alone being up the tallest astronomy tower, which was out of bounds except for classes. And add Nobert and their visibility cloak, and they might as well be packing their bags already. Had Harry thought that things couldn't have been worse, he was wrong. When Professor McGonagall appeared, she was leading Neville. Harry! Neville burst out the moment he saw the other two. I was trying to find to what you to warn you. I heard Malfoy saying he was going to catch you. He said you had a drag. Harry shook his head violently to shut Neville up, but Professor McGonagall had seen. She looked more likely to breathe fire than Nobert as she towered over the three of them. I would never have believed it of any of you. Mr. Filch says you were up in the astronomy tower. It's one o'clock in the morning. Explain yourselves. It was the first time Hermione had ever failed to answer a teacher's question. She was staring at her slippers as still as a statue. I think I've got a good idea of what's been going on, said Professor McGonagall. It doesn't take a genius to work it out. You're Frederick and Malfoy some cock and bull story about a dragon trying to get him out of bed and into trouble i've already caught him i suppose you think it's funny that longbottom here heard the story and believed it too harry caught neville's eyes and tried to tell him without words that this wasn't true because neville was looking stunned and hurt poor blundering neville harry knew what it must have cost him to try and find them in the dark to warn them I'm disgusted, said Professor McGonagall. Four students out of bed in one night. I've never heard of a, such a thing before. You, Miss Granger, I thought you had more sense. As for you, Mr. Potter, I thought Gryffindor meant more to you than this. All three of you will receive detentions. Yes, you too, Mr. Longbottom. Nothing gives you the right to walk around school at night, especially these days. It's very dangerous. And 50 points will be taken from Gryffindor. Fifty? Harry gasped. They would lose the lead, the lead he'd won in the last Quidditch match. Fifty points each, said Professor McGonagall, breathing heavily through her long pointed nose. Professor, please. You can't. Don't tell me what I can and can't do, Potter. Now get back to bed, all of you. I've never been more ashamed of Gryffindor students. A hundred and fifty point lots. That put Gryffindor in last place. And one night, they'd ruined any chance of Gryffindor had had for the house cup. Harry felt as though the bottom had dropped out of his stomach. How could they ever make up for this? Harry didn't sleep all night. He could hear Neville sobbing into his pillow for what seemed like hours. Harry couldn't think of anything to say to comfort him. He knew Neville, like himself, was draining the dawn. What would happen when the rest of Gryffindor found out what they'd done? At first, Gryffindor was passing the giant hourglass that recorded the house points the next day thought there had been a mistake. How could they suddenly have 150 points fewer than yesterday? And then the story started to spread. Harry Potter, the famous Harry Potter, the hero of two Quidditch matches, had lost them all those points, him and a couple of other stupid first years. From being one of the most popular and admired people at the school, Harry was suddenly the most hated. Even Ravenclaws and Hufflepuffs turned on him because everyone had been longing to see Slytherin you lose the house cup. Everywhere Harry went, people pointed and didn't trouble to lower their voices as they insulted him. Slytherin, on the other hand, clapped as he walked past them, whistling and cheering. Thanks, Potter, we owe you one. Only Ron stood by him. They'll all forget this in a few weeks. Fred and George have lost loads of points in all the time they've been here, and people still like them. They've ever never lost 150 points in one day ago, have they? Said Harry miserably. Well, no, Ron admitted. It was a bit late to repair their, repair their damage, but Harry swore to himself not to meddle in things that weren't his business from now on. He'd had it with sneaking around and spying. 
He felt so ashamed of himself that he went to Wood and offered to resign from the Quidditch team. Resign? Wood thundered. What good will that do? How are we going to get any points back if we can't win at Quidditch? But even Quidditch had lost its fun. The rest of the team wouldn't speak to Harry during the practice, and if they had to speak about him, they call him the Seeker. Hermione and Neville were suffering too. They didn't have as bad time a Harry as sorry. They didn't have as bad a time as Harry because they weren't as well known, but nobody would speak to them either. Hermione had stopped drawing attention to herself in class, keeping her head down and walking in silence. Harry was almost glad that the exams weren't far away. All the studying he had to do kept his mind off his misery. He, Ron, and Hermione kept themselves working late into the night, trying to remember the ingredients in complicated potions, learn charms and spells by heart, memorize the dates of magical discoveries and goblin rebellions. Then, about a week before the exams were due to start, Harry's new resolution not to interfere in anything that didn't concern him was put to an unexpected test. Walking back from the library on his own one afternoon, he heard somebody whimpering from a classroom up ahead. As he drew closer, he heard Quirrell's voice. No, no, not again, please. It sounded as though someone was threatening him. Harry moved closer. All right, all right, he heard Quirrell sob. Next second, Quirrell came hurrying out of the classroom, straightening his turban. He was pale and looked as though he was about to cry. He strode out of sight. Harry didn't think Quirrell even had even noticed him. He waited until Quirrell's footsteps had disappeared, then peered into the classroom. It was empty, but a door stood ajar at the other end. Harry was halfway toward it before he remembered what he'd promised himself about not meddling. All the same, he'd have gambled twelve sorcerer's stones that Snape had just left the room, and from what Harry had just heard, Snape would be walking with a new spring in his step. Quirrell seemed to have given in at last. Harry went back to the library, where Hermione was testing Ron on astronomy. Harry told them what he'd heard. Snape's done it then, said Ron. If Quirrell told him how to break his auntie dark full spell. They're still fluffy, though, said Hermione. Maybe Snape's found out how to get past him without asking Hagrid, said Ron, looking up at the thousands of books surrounding him. I bet there's a book somewhere in here telling you how to get past a giant three-headed dog. So what do we do, Harry? The light of adventure was kindling again in Ron's eyes, but Hermione answered before Harry could. Catch a Dumbledore, that's what we should have done ages ago. If we try anything ourselves, we'll be thrown out for sure. But we've got no proof, said Harry. Quirrell's too scared to back us up. Snape's only got to say he doesn't know how the troll got in on Halloween, and that we, he was nowhere near the third floor. Who do you think they'll believe, him or us? It's not exactly a secret we hate him. Dumbledore will think we've made it up to get him scacked. sacked. Sacked. Filch wouldn't help us if his life depended on it. He's too friendly with Snape. And the more students get thrown out, the better, he'll think. And don't forget, we're not supposed to know about the stone or Fluffy. That'll take a lot of explaining. Hermione looked convinced, but Ron didn't. If we do just a bit of poking around... No, said Harry flatly, we've done enough poking around. He pulled a map of Jupiter toward him and started to learn the names of its moons. The following morning, notes were delivered to Harry, Hermione and Neville at the breakfast table. They were all the same. Your detention will take place at 11 o'clock tonight. Meet Mr. Filch in the entrance hall, Professor M. McGonagall. Harry had forgotten that they still had detentions to do in the furrow over the points they'd lost. He had half expected Hermione to complain that this was a whole night of studying lost, but she didn't say a word. Like Harry, she felt they deserved what they got. At 11 o'clock that night, they said goodbye to Ron in the common room and went down to the entrance hall with Neville. Filch was already there, and so was Malfoy. Harry had also forgotten that Malfoy had gotten a detention too. Follow me, said Filch, lighting a lamp and heading them outside. I bet she'll think twice about breaking a school rule again, won't you, eh? He said, leering at them. Oh yes, hard work and pain are the best teachers, if you ask me. It's just a pity they let the old punishments die out. Hang you by your wrist from the ceiling for a few days. I've got the chain still in my office, keep them well oiled in case they're ever needed. Right, off we go. And don't think of running off now. It'll be worse for you if you do. He marched off across the dark grounds. Neville kept sniffling. Harry wondered what their punishment was going to be. It must be something really horrible, or Filch wouldn't be sounding so delighted. The moon was bright, but clouds scudding across it kept throwing them into darkness. Ahead, Harry could see the lighted window of Hagrid's hut. Then they heard a distant shout. Is that you, Filch? Hurry up! I want to get started! 
Harry's heart rose. If they were going to be walking with Hagrid, it wouldn't be so bad. His relief must have shown on his face because Foot said, I suppose you think you'll be enjoying yourself with that oaf. Well, think again, boy. It's time. It's into the forest you're going, and I'm much mistaken. You'll all come out in one piece. At this, Neville let out a little moan, and Malfoy stopped dead in his tracks. The forest, he repeated, but he didn't sound quite as cool as usual. We can't go in there at night. There are all sorts of things in the well, was I said. Neville clutched the sleeves of Harry's robe and made a choking noise. That's your problem, isn't it? said Filch, his voice cackling with glee. Should have thought them of them werewolves before you got in trouble, shouldn't you? Hagrid came striding toward them out of the dark, found at his uh, <clears throat> heel. He was carrying his large crossbow and a quiver of arrows hung over his shoulder. About time. I've been waiting for half an hour already. All right, Harry, Hermione. I shouldn't be too friendly to them, Hagrid, said Filch coldly. They're here to be punished, after all. That's why you're late, is it? said Hagrid, frowning at Filch. Been lecturing them, eh? It's not your piece to do that. You've done your best. I'll take them over here. I'll be back at dawn, said Filch, for what's left of them. He added nastily, and he turned and started back toward the castle, his lump body away in the darkness. Malfoy now turned to Hagrid. I'm not going in that forest, he said, and Harry was pleased to hear the note of panic in his voice. You are for your... Want to stay at Hogwarts, said Hagrid fiercely. You have done wrong and now you had got to pay for it. But this is servant stuff, not for students to do. I thought we'd be copying lines or something. If my father knew I was doing this, he'd tell you that's how it is at Hogwarts, Hagrid growled. Copying lines, that's good. What's good that to anyone? You go summit useful or you'll get out. If you think your father would rather you were expelled, then get back off to the castle and pack. Go on. Malfoy didn't move. He looked at Hagrid furiously, but then dropped his gaze. Right then, said Hagrid. Now, listen carefully, because it's dangerous what we're going to do tonight, and I don't want no one taking risk. Follow me over here a moment. He led them to the very edge of the forest. Holding his lamp up high, he pointed down a narrow, winding earth track that disappeared into the thick black trees. A light breeze lifted their hair as he looked into the forest. Look there, said Hagrid. Teeth and stuff shining on the ground. Silvery stuff. That's unicorn blood. There's a unicorn in there, then hurt badly by some amount. This is the second time in a week. I found one dead last Wednesday. We're going to try and find the poor thing. We might have to put it out of its misery. And what if whatever hurt the unicorn finds us first? Said Malfoy, unable to keep the fear out of his voice. There's nothing that lives in the forest that'll hurt her if you with me all found, said Hagrid. And keep to the path right now. We're going to split into two parties and follow the trail in different directions. There's blood all over the place. It must have been staggering around since last night, at least. I want Fang, said Malfoy quickly, looking at Fang's long teeth. All right, but I warn you, he's a coward, said Hagrid. So me, Harry and Hermione go one way and Draco, Neville and Fang go the other. Now, if any of us finds the unicorn, we'll send up green sparks, right? Get your ones out and practice now. That's it. If if anyone gets in trouble, send up red sparks, and we'll all come and find you. So be careful. Let's go. The forest was black and silent. A little way into it, they reached a fork in the earth path, and Harry, Hermione, and Hagrid took the left path, while Malfoy and Neville and Fang took the right. They walked in silence, their eyes on the ground. Every now and then, a ray of moonlight through the branches showed above it lit a spot of silver-blue blood on the fallen leaves. Harry saw that Hagrid looked very worried. Could a werewolf be killing the unicorns? Harry asked. Not fast enough, said Hagrid. It's not easy to catch a unicorn. They're powerful magic creatures. I never knew one to be hurt before. They walked past a mossy tree stump. Harry could hear running water. There must be a stream over somewhere close by. There were still spots of unicorn blood here and there along the winding path. You are right, Hermione? Hagrid whispered. Don't worry, it can't have gone far if it's this badly hurt. And then we'll be able to get behind that tree. Hagrid seized Harry and Hermione and hoisted them off the path behind a towering oak. He pulled out an arrow and fitted it into his crossbow, raising it ready to fire. The three of them listened. Something was slipping over dead leaves nearby. It sounded like a cloak trailing along the ground. Hagrid was squinting up the dark path, but after a few seconds, the sound faded away. I knew it, he murmured. There's somewhere in here that shouldn't be. A werewolf, Harry suggested. 
That was no werewolf, and it wasn't a unicorn either, said Hagrid grimly. Right, it's all on me, but careful now. He walked more slowly, ears straining for the faintest sound. Suddenly, in a clearing ahead, something definitely moved. Who's there? Hagrid called. Show yourself, I'm armed. And into the clearing came. Was it a man or a horse? To the waist, a man with red hair and beard, but below that was a horse's gleaming chestnut body with a long reddish tail. Hair in Hermione's jaws dropped open. Oh, it's you, Rowan, into Hagrid and Reef. How are you? He walked forward and shook the centre's hand. Good evening to you, Hagrid, said Ronan. He had a deep, sorrowful voice. Were you going to shoot me? Can't be too careful, Ronan, said Hagrid, patting his crossbow. There's some up bad loose in here at this forest. This is Harry Potter and Hermione Granger, by the way. Students up at the school, and this is Ronan, you two. He is a centaur. We noticed, said Hermione fitly. Good evening, said Ronan. Students are you, and do you learn much up at the school? Um... Uh... A bit, said Hermione timidly. A bit, well that's something, Rowan inside. He flung back his head and stared at the sky. Mars is bright tonight. Yeah, said Hagrid, glancing up too. Listen, I'm glad we've run into you, Ronan, because there's a unicorn been heard. You've seen anything? Ronan didn't answer immediately. He stared unblinkingly at the words and then sighed again. Always the innocent are the first victims, he said. So it has been for ages past, so is now. Yeah, said Hagrid, but have you seen anything, Ronan? Anything unusual? Mars is bright tonight, Ronan repeated, while Hagrid watched him impatiently, unusually bright. Yeah, but I was meaning anything unusual a bit nearer home, said Hagrid. So you hadn't noticed anything strange? Yet again, Ronan took a while to answer. At last, he said, the forest hides many secrets. A movement in the trees behind Ronan made Hagrid raise his bow again, but it was only a second centaur, black-haired and bodied and wilder looking than Ronan. Hello, Bane, said Hagrid. All right, good evening, Hagrid. I hope you're well. Well enough. Look, I've just been asking Ronan. You see anything odd in here lately? There's a unicorn been injured. Would well, you know anything about it? Bane walked over to stand next to Ronan. He looked skyward. Mars is bright tonight, he said simply. We've heard, said Hagrid grumpily. Well, if any of you do see anything, let me know, won't you? We'll be off. Harry and Hermione followed him out of the clearing, staring over the shoulders of Ronan and Bane until the trees blocked their view. Never, said Hagrid irritably, try and get a straight answer out of a centaur. Really, stargazers, not interested in anything closer in the moon. Are they? Many of them. In here, asked Hermione. Oh, a fair few. Keep themselves to themselves, mostly. But they're good enough about turning it up if ever I want a word. The deep-minded centres. They know things, just don't let on much. Do you think that was a centre we heard earlier? Said Hagrid. Harry. Did that sound like hooves to you? Nah, if you ask me, there was wet spin killing the unicorns. Never heard anything like it before. They walked on through the dense, stark trees. Harry kept looking nervously over his shoulder. He had the nasty feeling that they were being watched. He was very glad that they had Hagrid and his crossbow with them. They had just passed a bend in the path when Hermione grabbed Harry's arm. Hagrid, look, red sparks. The others are in trouble. You two wait here, Hagrid shouted. Stay on the path. I'll come back for you. They heard him crashing away through the undergrowth and stood looking at each other, very scared until they couldn't hear anything but the rustling of leaves around them. You don't think they have been hurt, do you? whispered Hermione. I don't care if Malfoy has, but if something's Scott Neville... It's our fault he's here in the first place. The minutes dragged by. That ear seemed sharper than usual. Harry seemed to be picking up every sign of the wind, every quacking twig. What was going on? Where were the others? At last, a great crunching noise announced Harry Hagrid's return. Malfoy, Neville and Fang were here with, were with him. Hagrid was fuming. Malfoy, it seemed, had sneaked up behind Neville and grabbed him as a joke. Neville had panicked and set off the sparks. We'll be lucky to catch anything now with the racket you two are making. Right, we're changing groups. Neville, you stay with me and Hermione. Harry, you go with Fang and this idiot. I'm sorry, Hagrid added in a whisper to Harry, but he'll have a harder time fighting you, and we've got to get this one, it's this done. So Harry set off into the heart of the forest with Malfoy and Fang. They walked for nearly half an hour. Deeper and deeper into the forest, until the path became almost impossible to follow because the trees were those thick. Harry thought the blood seemed to be getting thicker. There were splashes on roots of a tree, 
as though the poor creature had been thrashing around in pain close by. Harry could see a clearing ahead through the tangled branches of an ancient oak. Look, he murmured, holding out his arm to stop Malfoy. Something bright white was gleaming on the ground. They inched closer. It was the unicorn, all right, and it was dead. Harry had never seen anything so beautiful and sad. Its long, slender legs were stuck out at odd angles where it had fallen, and its mane was spread palely white on the dark leaves. Harry had taken one step forward it when a slithering sound made him freeze where he stood. A bush on the edge of the clearing quivered. Then, out of the shadows, a hooded figure came crawling across the ground like some stalking beast. Harry, Malfoy, and Fang stood transfixed. The cloaked figure reached the unicorn, lowered its head over the wound in the animal's side, and began to drink its blood. Ah! Malfoy let out a terrible scream and bolted. So did Fang. The hooded figure raised its head and looked right at Harry. Unicorn blood was dribbling down his front. It got to his feet and came swiftly towards Harry. He couldn't move for fear. Then a pain like he'd never felt before pierced his head. It was as though his scar was on fire. Half blinded, he staggered backward. He heard hoofs behind him, galloping, and something jumped clean over Harry, charging at the figure. The pain in Harry's head was so bad he fell to his knees. It took a minute or two to pass. When he looked up, the figure had gone. A centaur was standing over him, not Ronan or Bane. This one looked younger. He had white blonde hair and a palomino body. Oh, you're right, said the centaur, pulling Harry to his feet. Yes, thank you. What was that? The centaur didn't answer. He had astonishingly blue eyes, like pale sapphires. He looked carefully at Harry's, his eyes lingering on the scar that stood out, livid, on Harry's forehead. You are the Potter boy, he said. You had better get back to Hagrid. The forest is not safe at this time, especially for you. Can you ride? It will be quicker this way. My name is Ferenzi. He added as he lowered himself onto his front legs so that Harry could clamber onto his back. There was suddenly a sound of more galloping from the other side of the clearing. Ronan and Bane came bustling through the trees, their flanks heaving and sweaty. Frenzy! Ben, Bane thudded. What are you doing? You have a human on your back. Have you no shame? Are you a common mule? Do you realize who this is? said Ferenz. This is the Potter boy. The quicker he leaves the forest, the better. What have you been telling him, growled Bane. Remember, friends, we are sworn not to set ourselves against the heavens. Have we not read what is to come in the movement out of the plants, uh, uh, of the planets? Ronan pawed the ground nervously. I'm sure friends thought he was acting for the best, he said in his gloomy voice. Bane kicked his back leg in anger. For the best, what is that to do with us? Centaurs are concerned with what have been foretold. It is not our business to run around like donkeys after stray humans in our forest. Fire ends suddenly reared onto his hind legs in anger, so that Harry had to grab his shoulders to stay on. Do you not see that unicorn? Fire ends. Fire. Fire. Oh, sorry. Fire ends bellowed at Bane. Do you not understand why it was killed? Or have the planets not let you in on that secret? I set myself against with lurking in this forest, Bane. Yes, with humans alongside me if I must. And Fire Ends whisked around with Harry clutching on as best as he could. They plunged off into the trees, leaving Ronan and Bane behind them. Harry didn't have a clue what was going on. Why is Bane so angry? He asked. What was that thing you saved me from anyway? Fire ends slow to a walk, warned Harry to keep his head bowed in case of low-hanging branches, but did not answer Harry's question. They made their way through the trees in silence for so long that Harry thought Fire ends didn't want to talk to him anymore. They were passing through a particularly dense path of trees, however, when Fire ends suddenly stopped. Harry Potter, do you know what unicorn blood is used for? No, said Harry, startled by the odd question. We've only used the horn and tail, hair and potions. That's because it is a monstrous thing to slay a unicorn, said Firenze. Only one who has nothing to lose and everything to gain would commit such a crime. The blood of a unicorn will keep you alive, even if you are an inch from death, but at a terrible price. You have slain something pure and defenceless to save yourself, and you will have but a half-life, a cursed life, from the moment the blood touches your lips. Harry stared at the back of Firenze's head, which was strapped silver in the moonlight. 
But who'd be that desperate? He wondered around. If you're going to be cussed forever, that's death's better, isn't it? It is, Fire Ends agreed, unless all you need to, is to stay alive long enough to drink something else. Something that'll bring you back to full strength and power. Something that'll mean you can never die. Mr. Potter, do you know what is hidden in the school at this very moment? The Sorcerer's Stone. Of course, the Elixir of Life, but I don't understand who... Can you think of no one who has waited many years to return to power, who has clung to life awaiting their chance? It was as though an iron fist had clenched suddenly around Harry's heart. Over the rustling of the trees, he seemed to hear one more, more that Hagrid had told him on the night they had met. Some say he died. Coddle swap, in my opinion. Don't know if he had enough human left in him to die. You mean, Harry Cook, that was Vol- Harry! Harry, are you all right? Hermione was running towards them down the path, Hagrid puffing along behind her. I'm fine, said Harry, hardly knowing what he was saying. The unicorn's dead, Hagrid. It's in the clearing back there. This is where I leave you, Fire Ends murmured as Hagrid hurried off to examine the unicorn. You are safe now. Harry slid off the, his back. Good luck, Harry Potter, said Fire Ends. The planets have been read wrongly before now, even by centaurs. I hope this is one of those times. He turned and cantered back into the depths of the forest, leaving Harry shivering behind him. Vaughn had fallen asleep in the dark common room, waiting for them to return. He shouted something about Quidditch fowls. When Harry roughly shook him awake, in a matter of seconds, though, he was wide-eyed as Harry began to tell him and Hermione what had happened in the forest. Harry couldn't sit down. He paced up and down in front of the fire. He was still shaking. Snape wants the stuff for Voldemort, and Voldemort's waiting in the forest. And all this time, we thought Snape just wanted to get rich. Stop saying the name, said Ron in a terrified whisper, as if he thought Voldemort could hear them. Harry wasn't listening. For fire end saved me, but he shouldn't have done so. Bane was furious. He was talking about interfering with what the planets say is going to happen. They must show that Voldemort's coming back. Bane thinks fire ends should have let Voldemort kill me. I suppose that's written in the stars as well. Will you stop saying the name? Ron hissed. So all I've got to wait for now is Snape to steal the stone. Harry went on feverishly. Then Voldemort will be able to come and finish me off. Well, I suppose Bane will be happy. Marnie looked very frightened, but she had a word of comfort. Harry, everyone says Dumbledore's the only one you know who was ever afraid of. Well, it's Dumbledore around. You know who won't touch you. Anyway, who says the centaurs are right? It sounds like fortune telling to me. And Professor McGonagall says that a very Im imprecise branch of magic. The sky had turned light before they stopped talking. They were so bad. They went to bed exhausted. Their throats sore, but the night surprises wasn't over. When Harry pulled back his sheets, he found his invisibility cloak folded neatly underneath them. There was a note pinned to it, just in case. So that's the end of this chapter. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please click many likes and subscribe Reading Club. So I'll come back later with a new and improved channel. Thank you for listening.